Hi kidlets, this is your very last notes video. I apologize, I have severe laryngitis. That's why I didn't post the notes yesterday. I had absolutely no voice. I'm only now kind of starting to be able to talk again. Um, just as a reminder, your notes quiz is tomorrow, your last one. You need to be done with all of your notes quizzes if you've missed any for this unit by Tuesday. Um, you can come in either tomorrow at lunch or Tuesday at lunch in order to do those. Um, your test is Wednesday. Your atmosphere rough draft paper is due on Wednesday. The final draft due on Friday. Um, also, I've only got about half of your submissions for um, the request for roles for your launch uh, duties. So black holes is where we are finishing up this semester in terms of content. Um, I know a lot of you have had a lot of questions about these. These are the best pictures I could find on the internet re representing um, kind of some of the, the humor associated with black holes. No, we're not getting sucked into them. I did try and find a picture of Justin Bieber being sucked into one, um, but I was unsuccessful. There's a, something you could Photoshop and put on Google Images. Um, so remember that mass is the determining factor of how stars evolve and neutron stars form as a result of protons and electrons recombining to form stable neutrons which, stop, which halt the gravitational collapse of stellar remnants. But when you have a star that's more massive and the core of the star exceeds three solar masses, um, nothing can halt that, that collapse. Um, so there is a mass limit for neutron stars, um, which is about three solar masses, and anything greater than that is a candidate to become of a black hole. Uh, to become a black hole, so there's nothing that can halt that collapse. So that infinitely collapses and essentially puts a tear in space time, and we call that a black hole. Um, so in order for something to actually be a black hole, it means that the escape velocity is infinite. It is greater than the speed of light. Um, so nothing could essentially break free from it, hence why it is black, because nothing actually escapes for us to see. So if you remember last semester, we talked about some concepts associated with escape velocity, because we have to, in order for, to, for us to send things into space, um, they have to achieve escape velocity. Um, when we have meteorites that impact Earth, um, those had to have escaped the bodies of their parent bodies. Um, so like asteroids, it's much easier for something to escape from an asteroid with lower mass than it is from Mars. But we do have meteorites from Mars because that would mean that the object had to have been accelerated beyond escape velocity to leave. Um, in theory, there could be Earth meteorites on Mars that have escaped our velocity. So escape velocity on Earth is 11 kilometers per second. Um, I wouldn't necessarily need you to know that, but you would need to know how to apply it. So escape velocity would decrease as you increase with distance away, and it would increase with the mass of a body. So to illustrate that, I have another slide here. So if we had an incredibly massive body, such as Jupiter, the escape velocity here would be very, very, very high. So we have an increase in escape V. So this is why planets like Jupiter and Saturn are able to retain the light gases such as helium and hydrogen. Whereas on Earth, we don't have any terrestrial hydrogen at all. Um, there's actually a hel or helium, I'm sorry, we have a helium shortage because um, those light gases were able to escape our velocity. We have the mass to retain the heavier elements like nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen, which make up our atmosphere. But the atmospheres of the heavier planets are made of the lighter elements. So if we have a smaller object, the escape velocity is going to be less. So if we have an object um, that is small, um, or if we're located a far distance away, the escape velocity is going to decrease. But if we were to take the mass of Earth and we were to compress that to smaller, the same mass but smaller, so increasing the density, that would increase our escape velocity. So I may ask you questions like if, it, if uh, Earth's mass increased or decreased, um, what sort of velocity would you need in order to leave? So you would just have to be able to apply it. You don't need to know the equation. So here explains that in a little more detail, pretty much the same thing I just said. So the Schwarzschild radius is the radius of a sphere that if all of the mass within that object was compressed within the sphere, the escape speed would equal the speed of light. So anything with mass, you included, has a Schwarzschild radius. So a black hole is an example of something which is actually smaller than its Schwarzschild radius. So that's why when um, we see a stellar remnant that collapses below this radius, light cannot escape, which is why it is black, because there is no object that's directly visible, because light can escape. So the escape velocity is higher than the light inside, and it's equal to the light at it. 
So essentially here, the escape velocity is equal right at the Schwarzschild radius to the speed of light. So if the radius is smaller than the Schwarzschild radius, like I said, then you have a black hole. So anything that has mass has the potential to become a black hole if it's compressed small enough. And this is what you guys will be doing in your lab tomorrow. So if anything, it's compressed smaller than its Schwarzschild radius because you having mass have a Schwarzschild radius too, then it can become a black hole. Um, so here is the equation for the Schwarzschild radius. Um, for your lab tomorrow, you'll need to uh, calculate this, but you won't have to memorize it. So remember that G is our universal constant of gravity, which is, and you don't need to remember this. If you needed to know it, I would give the, you the equation on a test. 6.02 times 10 to the negative 11th, and that's Newtons um, over kilogram squared. Um, and then M is our mass, and then C again is the speed of light. So the event horizon is the boundary at which uh, nothing can be visible from the inside to the outside and the outside to the inside. So essentially what happens at the event horizon stays at the event horizon. So nothing can escape at the event horizon um, or from the Schwarzschild radius. So the event horizon is that boundary in which nothing is observable to the outside world. This is the boundary. And um, in layman's terms, this is past the point of no return. Things within the event horizon are not visible at all to the outside observer. So we'll talk in a moment about time dilation. Um, so if you were an observer that was, say, way out here, and here would be our event horizon, as you saw something approach the event horizon, you would essentially see them hitting this point and times, and you would see them standing still. This happens because we would see them begin to slow down and slow down and slow down so that by the time that they actually reached the boundary, we would see them completely stop moving. But for that person that was approaching it or spacecraft or whatever it was, they would experience no change. So we'll talk about that in a moment and this is known as time dilation. So we would see them red shifted and red shifted and just that red shift continuing to elongate until it would appear that, um, that they actually st stood still. So real quick, some general relativity effects. Um, if you were far enough away, such as us from our galactic center, um, we would be unable to determine the difference between a large object or an object of mass, which would also put a, a big dent in space-time, and a black hole, which is an infinite hole in space-time. So the observational effects from a, different, from a distance of a massive star and a black hole are essentially the same. So, but it's at small, different, small distance is that we would be able to notice the deeper gravitational potential. So such as this very deep tear in space-time and this is kind of a drawing of just a massive star in space-time. So some of the things that an astronaut would experience if they were to approach a black hole, and again we are equal distance from one to where we are not um, at a hazard of that at all. We are so far from the galactic center and from that event horizon, but as something approached a black hole or approached the event horizon, um, if you were our astronaut that was normal size, they would experience something that is my favorite word on the face of the planet besides boogers and poop, and that is spaghettification. Um, if something were to undergo spaghettification, it would be it would undergo tidal forces, which would stretch vertically and squeeze laterally. So you'd have forces coming in from this side and from this side, stretching it this way um, infinitely. You would you would just be stretched like spaghetti. Hence the name. So as I mentioned before, one other effect is called time dilation. So if we had clocks that were really far away, so if we had say a spacecraft that was out here. And the clocks here were at 12, they, they started here at 12 o'clock. Well, after three hours, you can see that this clock is at three. But a clock here that's a little bit closer is only at 2.55. This clock that is even closer is at 2.30. Whereas the clock that is right at the event horizon is at noon. It has not undergone any change in time whatsoever. So time dilation, which is what this is, this is the, is the progressive slowing of clocks as they near the event horizon. Um, it becomes infinite, sorry about my phone, becomes infinite at the event horizon. So really, in theory, if you were on this spacecraft right here, you would not age and people back here would. We can actually even see these effects on jets. We can put clocks on jets and at the microscopic um, atomic clock level, 
um, clocks that are on jets move slower than they do on Earth. So clocks on Earth move faster, and we saw this on the Apollo missions and putting clocks up there as well. So it's very, very minuscule differences, but they would be infinite differences here at the, the event horizon. So again, we talked about the gravitational redshift. So for an observer that was back here, we would see um, things continue to be redshifted as they approached the event horizon. So black holes can't be imaged directly, um, but there are ways that we can detect them if they're in a binary pair. So um, binary pairs really become key to, to determining the mass and the rotation of things that we can't image directly. And this is what Chandra has been so useful for. Um, so if something is part of a binary, we can determine its mass by looking at the orbital velocity and the radial velocity of its binary partner. So in this case, say this was a star, or if it was a neutron star, um, there would be an accretion disk that could form around it. And as we'll see in just a moment, um, that accretion disk can be a large X-ray emitter. But from mass and rotation calculations, if the binary pair is observed to have a rotation that is much faster than it should have, then it has to have something accelerating it. And if nothing is observable, then we can make the assumption that there must be something with an extremely large gravitational force strong enough to accelerate its companion. So that's one way that a black hole can be detected, is if its binary companion has an accelerated rotation much higher than you would expect it to be for its given mass. So um, here are some black hole candidates. So these are based on their masses. Um, so here we can see Cygnus X1. That's thought to be a black hole candidate because it has a stellar core of greater than three solar masses. Um, so right here, this one's greater than six. Um, this one is an Ursa Major Sagittarius. This is the one that is at the center of our galaxy, um, or generally in the center of our galaxy. So all of these are black hole candidates. That might be a question I ask you on your exam, would be if I gave you a list, if you could pull out which could be candidates for black holes and which may not be. Previously, in the last notes, I talked about the, um, the supernova of 1987. Right now, they don't know if that could be a black hole or a neutron star because at this point, nothing has formed in that space. Um, sometimes it can take a while. So most of these would be very old supernovas. Um, but at this point, you know, 30 years later after that supernova was visible, um, there so another way that black holes can be detected, um, again, if they're in a binary, that's really key, is that the matter that gets pulled off can form an accretion disk, and that accretion disk can be a strong X-ray source. So if you remember, we had talked about Wien's Law, which allows us to determine what the wavelength is. So Wien's Law was 3 million uh, nanometers divided by the temperature, and that gives you your wavelength, and that wavelength corresponds to x-rays. So this is what Chandra is imaging because the Chandra telescope is imaging x-ray sources. Um, so the Chandra telescope has been able to image these x-ray sources from binaries of black holes. So remember that um, within the black hole, nothing can be imaged because um, things that fall in past the event horizon are not observable to the outside world. Um, but as things hit the event horizon, there is um, X-ray emissions that are given off. So that's what we're measuring, is as it hits that event horizon, which would be right here, that's the X-ray source. It's not within the black hole itself. It's as matter hits the event horizon from a binary pair, it's emitting X-rays. So black holes and neutron stars can both be in binaries, which can assist with mass determinations, and in the case of black holes, um, really just prove their existence. So in the case of neutron stars, you can have the accreted matter onto the neutron star, which forms an X-ray flash um, as it falls onto the neutron star, in which case you would see light emissions here. But in terms of a black hole, um, remember that nothing, no light can be detectable whatsoever. So there could be an accretion disk surrounding the event horizon, and at the event horizon, um, you could have X-ray emission, as we discussed, um, but it would completely disappear beyond the event horizon without a trace because even the speed of light is not fast enough to, to overcome the immense gravity of a black hole. 
Additionally, um, if you had a star that was orbiting around a black hole and the black hole was, um, was able to accrete and pull in all of the matter from the star, as the final remnants of the star crossed over the event horizon, that would be such a large amount of matter that would cross into the black hole that it would emit gamma rays. Um, and that would be seen by us as a gamma ray burst. Um, so gamma ray bursts, or GRBs, are something that the Compton um, Gamma Ray Observatory is looking for, one of the great observatories, including Chandra. Um, and these would be highly energetic bursts that would be visible from Earth, even if this was in a distant galaxy, because these are the most energetic objects, the most energetic events in the universe. So, and that would be as a binary star um, finally passes over the entire star after there's no more matter left except the core of the star passes over the event horizon. So here's a little summary um, of the death of massive stars. So there is your second summary. So you could read through these. This would be kind of a, a good place to take notes on. That's it, guys. This is your very last notes. See you tomorrow.